Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we enhance your brain with weird and wonderful science. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, Liam Burt talks about how he became an organometallic chemist. But first up, here's news of life extension, fat napping, CRISPR fat signals and compulsory Alexa. Calorie restriction has restrictions. Researchers from the University of California have found that the extensions to lifespan granted across species by a calorie-restricted diet go away unless you also restrict the amount of the amino acid methionine in the diet. In yeast. Yeast has a very short lifespan and is easier to study. Methionine is found in meat, fish and dairy products and it plays an important role in many cell functions, including the expression of DNA. Methionine is also used by our body to build the proteins that we use to make tissues and organs. Restricting the amount of calories while keeping all the other nutrients at normal levels has been shown to extend the lifespan of yeast, worms, flies, fish and mice, amongst others. In primates like us, we're not as certain that it works. Calorie-restricted diets seem to improve the health of rhesus monkeys and perhaps may extend their life. Short-term caloric restriction studies in humans seem to show some metabolic health benefits, but can cause fertility problems. Long-term calorie restriction studies in humans haven't been published, so we don't know if it would extend your lifespan or if not enjoying your food just makes you feel like life has taken longer. The researchers found that there was molecular communication between the glucose-sensing parts of a cell and the regulation of methionine in the cell. Glucose restriction directly caused the cell to decrease the amount of enzymes and transporters it made for methionine, which resulted in a lower concentration of methionine in the cell. When the researchers tried supplementing the methionine in the yeast food, they found that the yeast lost the extra lifespan they'd gained from calorie restriction. They also found that genetic changes that cause the yeast to either make less methionine or take up less methionine from their food allowed yeast to live longer. The researchers conclude that the amino acid methionine is an important part of how restricting the calories in your diet while keeping all the other nutrients the same leads to a longer lifespan in so many different species. However, extra methionine undoes the gains from caloric restriction. The paper was titled Lifespan extension by glucose restriction is abrogated by methionine supplementation, crosstalk between glucose and methionine, and implication of methionine as a key regulator of lifespan, and was published in the journal Science Advances. Sleep and grow thin. Researchers from Seoul National University in 2017 showed that sleeping less than the recommended 7 to 9 hours per night is linked to having greater body fat increased risk of obesity, and can also influence how easily you lose weight on a calorie-restricted diet. Too little sleep can determine how much fat is lost, as well as how much muscle mass you retain while on a calorie-restricted diet. 2010 research from the University of Chicago and the University of Wisconsin found that sleeping 5.5 hours each night over a two-week period while on a calorie-restricted diet resulted in less loss of fat when compared to sleeping eight and a half hours each night. But it also resulted in a greater loss of muscle mass. In 2018, the University of South Carolina conducted a study over an eight week period when sleep was reduced by one hour each night for five nights of the week. These results showed that even catch up of sleep over the weekend may not be enough to reverse the negative effects of sleep deprivation while on a calorie restricted diet. Sleep influences two important appetite hormones in our body, leptin and ghrelin. 
leptin decreases appetite. So when leptin levels are high, we usually feel full. Ghrelin can stimulate appetite. It's thought to be responsible for our feeling hungry. Two studies in 2004 from the University of Chicago and from Stanford University found that restricting your hours of sleep increases levels of ghrelin and decreases leptin. So you get hungrier. A 2012 study from Columbia University found that the areas of the brain responsible for reward are more active in response to food after six nights of only four hours sleep when compared to people who had six nights of nine hours sleep. So food is more rewarding when you're sleep deprived, leading you to eat more. A 2015 study from the University of Colorado found that sleep deprived people snack more often and tend to choose carbohydrate rich foods and sweet tasting snacks, compared to those who get enough sleep. A study from Cantona Hospital St. Gallen in Switzerland in 2011 found that sleep loss can impair our body's response to insulin, reducing its ability to take up glucose. In the long term, this can lead to type 2 diabetes. A 2020 study from Northumbria University showed that a single night of restricting sleep to just four hours is enough to harm the insulin response to glucose intake in healthy young men. A 2011 study from the University of Barcelona showed that this excess glucose that isn't processed normally turns into fat. A lack of sleep can increase appetite by changing hormones, makes us more likely to eat unhealthy foods, and influences how body fat is lost or gained. CRISPR weight loss. Researchers at Harvard University have converted human white fat cells into something that works like energy burning brown fat using CRISPR gene editing tools. The engineered cells have helped mice avoid weight gain and diabetes when on a high fat diet. The researchers use CRISPR to target a gene for a protein called UCP1, which is uniquely expressed in brown fat, to allow white fat cells to turn chemical energy into heat as if they were brown fat cells. The researchers called the altered fat cells human brown-like cells or humble cells. Having engineered the humble cells, the researchers transplanted either white fat, brown fat or humble cells into mice bred to have a weakened immune system that wouldn't reject human tissue. All of the mice were then fed a high-fat diet. Over a 12-week period, the mice given white fat cells gained weight. The mice transplanted with either brown fat or humble cells gained significantly less weight. These mice transplanted with brown fat or humble cells were also more sensitive to insulin, making them less likely to develop diabetes. The researchers envisioned that in the future we could remove white fat from obese people, convert it to humble cells with CRISPR genetic engineering, and then re-implant the converted cells back into people who can't lose weight from diet and exercise. The team found that the transplanted humble cells seemed to send a nitric oxide signal to the existing stores of brown fat in the mice, stimulating them to burn more energy. Copying this chemical signal to activate the body's own brown fat to burn more energy could provide a way to treat obesity without any surgery at all. The paper was titled CRISPR-engineered human brown-like adipocytes prevent diet-induced obesity and ameliorate metabolic syndrome in mice and was published in the journal Science Translational Medicine. Alexa, don't! Amazon is offering landlords a special version of Amazon Echo to allow them to charge more for a smart home that will let you play music, dim the lights, get a weather report, and the usual things you can do with a smart speaker. Alexa Residential would also let you pay rent or ask for repairs by voice. The kicker is that the Amazon Echo drop-in feature will allow the landlord to see and hear anything happening in the range of the smart speaker. Amazon promised that although your voice is recorded by Amazon Echo, the recordings are deleted by Amazon once a day. It's already known that Amazon employs people to create transcriptions from these recordings. It's deceptive to only tell us the recordings are deleted and not mention that the transcripts are kept forever. Can landlords get these transcripts? Who else could buy them? In America, 
Amazon has already partnered with rent payment companies to roll out Alexa smart home devices to 30,000 apartments. Given that the stated purpose is to pay the rent and talk to property maintenance, it's hard to see tenants being allowed to refuse access or switch it off. Amazon have written on their blog, Alexa for residential goes beyond the smart home. It also enables property managers to provide custom voice experiences for their residents, including information about property amenities and custom services. They seem to strongly suggest that you can't log into your own account directly on the devices. Instead, you link your account to the estate agency or landlord's account. On the blog it says, Residents don't have to have an Amazon account. Purchase any devices or set up anything in the apartment. It will all just work. From the moment they walk into their new apartment, residents can ask Alexa to remind them when it's recycling day, play the news and weather every morning, or control their apartment's smart home features just by asking. With a few extra steps, residents can also link their own Amazon account to use all the Alexa features and manage the device in the unit through their Alexa app alongside any other Alexa-enabled devices they already own. A group of New York City apartment residents successfully sued their landlord to require physical keys in addition to a smart lock. The tenants group was concerned that the smart lock could be used to surveil, track and intimidate tenants, claiming the smart lock could track their comings and goings. The New York Times reported that smart home devices have become increasingly common tools for domestic abusers, as they're able to remotely control the technology in the home to harass and bully others. I thought I'd turn the air conditioner on, but now it's off again. I thought I'd turn the heater off, but now it's on again. And so on. What kind of data is Amazon collecting in Alexa for residential, and what kind of data are they allowing landlords and estate agencies to collect? In 2018, Amazon accidentally sent a German man 1,700 voice files from someone else's account. They sent someone else a Portland couple's recorded conversations. In 2019, Amazon spent large amounts of money to spy on their own employees. Given that the customer here is the landlord, not the tenant, I wouldn't trust Amazon to give priority to a tenant's privacy. Sometimes convenience isn't worth the cost. If you have the choice. When nothing, nothing can possibly go wrong. Go wrong. Raw. Go wrong. Oh my God. Shut down. Shut down immediately. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. How do you choose a path in a scientific career? Liam Burt is an organometallic synthetic chemist at the Australian National University who's been involved with science communication with the young Tassie scientists. I spoke with Liam by Zoom and continued by asking him to tell me some of his adventures. I often like to sit back and reflect on the key moments of of my journey as a researcher and as a chemist and, of course, as a scientist. The thing I really like about science that we don't touch on enough is I refer to as the wheel of science. It's about finding a mentor, they mentor you, and there comes a natural time when you have to mentor someone else. And so I guess through the Young Tassie Scientist Program, I had that very special moment and experience very early on, just as a a third-year university student. So I hadn't even become technically a scientist yet, but I got to have my mentoring moment. And for me, my science journey, as a quick background, my science journey began when I was six years old. I'm one of those interesting kids, I guess. I told my grandparents at six years old, Nan, I want to be an inventor scientist, quote-unquote. And I didn't quite know what that meant, but I think I've kind of kept to that. And so for me, being a a young Tasmanian boy in the northwest coast of Tasmania, I've always wanted to go to university to become a scientist. And so for me, when I arrived at the University of Tasmania for my first laboratory session, 
I put on my UTAS lab coat and I saw the Lion logo and I can't describe that feeling of putting it on. I'll never forget that. It's one of my happiest memories of my entire life. So when I got to go out for a couple of years later for the young Tassie scientists, I obviously take some UTAS lab coats for my special little helpers in these primary schools. And we went to a, a school up in Boat Harbour, a small seaside town in northwest Tasmania, where I'm from. And this little kid comes up to me and says, oh, my God, it's you. You're finally here. Obviously, everyone's normally really excited. But the teacher has to warn you that this this uh, little kid who knows exactly that you're coming, he knows everything about you, has so many questions. And so I got to ask him, yeah, little guy, do you, uh, do you want to be my assistant for the day? And obviously, his uh, eyes just lit up. We folded up the big Utah's lab coat for him and put it over him. And that was probably the most special moment of my communication life because as he pulls the collar up and over, he looks down on the lapel and sees the logo and does exactly the same reaction that I'd done two years ago as a grown man. So to see a little kid have that moment of, you know what, I'm going to be a scientist as well. Words can't just to, to, to describe things like that. And I've had many experiences of that calibre, uh, especially with the young Tassie scientists. It's a phenomenal program, especially to see little kids have magic moments like that through us. Very rewarding. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so I guess one more other thing is that I could talk about is we've talked a little bit about my research and some of the science communication stuff that I've done but I've actually been involved with quite a number of other chemistry projects. So I mentioned that I am an organometallic chemist nowadays, and I guess that is what I'll probably be much into the future. And I've also mentioned that I was quite a keen bean when I first arrived at university. So as soon as I arrived, obviously I loved my lectures. I was so happy to be learning about all these things. So I kept pestering these lecturers saying, you know, can I come in the lab? Can I come and have a look at what really happens? And I'm sure it got quite annoying, but I pestered them for a good eight or nine months. And then all of a sudden, I was able to use my spare time in between lectures to go and volunteer as an undergraduate researcher in my first year. So I was straight into the lab, got to play with some metals for the first time. And I started out even my very first project was on metals as an organometallic chemist. And that was great. And then that project sort of ended. I worked over the summer there in between the university semesters. So for a couple of months, and then that sort of project ended at the start of my second year. And I was like, well, you know what? I haven't quite had enough here. Uh, and so I got picked up by another group as an organic chemist. So no metals allowed now, purely as an organic chemist. And I got to work with natural products. So as a part of that project, rather than using, trying to make these metal carbon bonds and stuff like that, I was trying to make carbon carbon bonds. And not just that, but extracting very valuable chemicals out of native Tasmanian plants. So obviously, it's no, no lie. I really love Tasmania. So to be able to play a very, very small role in something like that was amazing. But, you know, I'd be doing very different things to what I was used to at the time. And definitely what I'm used to now is, you know, people, especially like biologists and botanists and people in the plants department would go off to all sorts of mountains and wilderness areas and pick these native Tasmanian plants as part of their work and then they'd bring some to us and we would dry them out and let them sit in the sunshine and then you know we would put them inside of a big blender essentially and like crush them all up like what you might use in your kitchen for oregano and stuff like that put them in a spice grinder and then we would put all of these we would actually run them through a coffee machine which was a terrific little idea that was happening at the University of Tasmania at the time still is and we would essentially take these native Tasmanian plants and run them through a coffee machine with essentially vodka, actually, you know, like a mixture of ethanol and water, essentially with vodka, and we'd get this lovely green and brown mixture out on the other side, and we would be able to separate all of the very rare compounds out of there and then look at their reactivity. So as a researcher, or as a, a volunteer researcher, I was helping the PhD students at the time and so I would extract some chemicals and they would help me do small reactions as part of to make up for their thesis. So that was another very different area. That project came to an end. He's still my best mentor up until today. But my supervisor uh, through that project, I stayed with his group, but he said it'd be great if we could send you out to all the other groups. So after that, I went and worked on some plastics, which is obviously different again, trying to take these small little 
molecules and put them all together in a big long chain to make a polymer or a plastic, stuff like that that the CSIRO started in Australia and have uh, won numerous awards for, given us our lovely banknotes. So I got to have a, a bit of a go at making like some unique plastics as well. And then after that, I came back and got into a bit of the, what I mentioned another time with photoreactors. So being able to use blue LEDs and green LEDs, visible light to make new chemical bonds. And I like building things. I build things with my hands. That's what I do. So at that time, I was actually building these photoreactors at the start of my third year. And that's obviously now become quite a, quite a nice area down there. I kept doing that for quite a while in amongst other projects. So I guess that I was really lucky to have something like that because I'd done, apart from, say, analytical chemistry, like measuring toxic bits in water and separating out DNA and electrodes and stuff like that, I hadn't done as much as that. But as far as synthetic chemistry goes, so making new molecules, I'd done almost all of them before I'd got into, I guess, uh, official research, so to speak. So I got to see so much before I actually got to before my time, I guess. And I've got so many wonderful memories from all of those times. <laughs> and it all came together. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, I guess, something... It's really starting to pay dividends now. Being in a PhD, you're obviously... You're at the forefront. You're becoming the expert in your small little area. So I guess... I mean, I'm, I, I uh, easily get distracted by new and fascinating ideas, even when they... Sometimes my boss might suggest to me this isn't of our biggest concern uh, but I still like to connect these dots of all these different areas that lots of people haven't done but I've had little tasters I guess of all the areas so I really pride myself on my ability to connect the dots that other people would have trouble with because they've not done those multiple areas so yeah it's absolutely paid dividends it's really rewarding <laughs> Would you have any advice for students that are thinking of trying to follow your path into chemistry? Absolutely. Yeah, pretty much science in general. So as far as following the path of being a scientist, yeah, it's, it's pretty clear cut. All you need to do to, I guess, start off a science career is it's just as easy as going largely to university and doing a general science degree, like your Bachelor of Science or Bachelor of Marine Studies or something like that. And the best thing to do if you're doing one of those is you can do lots of different subjects in your first year of university. And I almost guarantee you, if you think you like science, there's a very high chance you'll find what you're looking for in that first year. But having said that, though, I'm also, I've done quite a lot of work as a senior student ambassador, especially for the ANU. So again, using those skills to go into schools, talk to year 11, 10, 11 and 12 kids about applying to uni and choosing your courses and all that stuff like that. And I find through that that a lot of people get a lot of pressure on them to sort of choose in year 12. And I think that's a bit unrealistic, you know, like it's like, you know, you have to choose in year 12. And for me, as I love to say, I really didn't choose that I was going to be a chemist until technically I had finished university. I'd done all three years and at the end I was a chemist and I made my choice then not year 12. That's a very bad idea. I think we lose a lot of people in science and I want to see you at uni. If you like a bit of science, choose it. It's not for everyone, but I think that that would be better. So keep a very open mind because it is, it's just impossible to know how much good science there is out there if you're in year 10, 11 or 12. Don't make your choice then. Have a taste, have a play around, make your choice later. That's probably the best advice I have. I think they're very wise words. Well, Liam, thank you very much. Oh, no worries. Thank you so much for having me, Ian. It's been a delight to have a chat. That was the second and final part of my interview with Liam Burt from the Australian National University talking about synthetic chemistry and science communication. You can now see the video of my interviews with James Hayes about odour, Ian Bryce about masks, Bonnie, Kirsten and Martin about the search for life on Mars, Sylvia Vicenzi about brain development, Dipon Sarkar about food microbiology, and Liam Burt about organometallic synthesis on the Diffusion YouTube channel. Subscribe and like at youtube.com slash C slash Diffusion Radio. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? 
send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolfe. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including Radio Blue Mountains 89.1 FM in New South Wales, 8 Triple C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 NVR in Nambucca Valley, 3 NVR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7 LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, and 2 XFM in Canberra. Diffusion is now narrowcast on Indigo FM 88 in northeastern Victoria. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science 360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than a thousand previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf. Support Diffusion by buying from the affiliate links at diffusionradio.com slash support. I'm Ian Wolf. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.